I'm still sat here with Constantine Sanders, um, who's Professor of Philosophy at um, Hertfordshire, and we're sat here in Regent's Park in um, Oxford uh, today. And we've been talking about philosophy of action and belief and reason and motivation, why we do things. Who cares? Why, why does it matter? What's, what's going to, the so what? Yeah, that's that? a very good and difficult question. And I'm actually, I'm torn two ways in this. I, I have moments, I, I was recently part of a debate arguing that philosophy doesn't matter. And part of me does believe, <laughs> does believe yeah. this, that we can, you know, things can be interesting in their own right. And, and maybe yeah. that's the end of it. Um, on the other hand, I, I'm... I think, well, maybe that's true of most philosophy, but surely not philosophy of action. <laughs> Your that, bit of philosophy. My bit of philosophy matters. Other people's, yeah. Exactly. Um, and, and sometimes maybe the smaller questions matter more than, than the larger ones. And um, so I can give you t two very different kinds of, of reason sure, why, yeah. why, why this matters. And I'll start with the maybe um, possibly smaller of the two. Um, so if you've got a kind of reductivist account of... Um, motivation or why why humans or maybe all animals act or behave as they do mm. whether it's power sex money and so on um it it can affect everything from um the kind of advertising you create in order to get yeah. people to do things from how you construct your supermarkets what kind of communication technology you build and so on and to focus on this last example so mm. um john locke who we don't think of as a psychologist mm. um but was very very influential in the in the history of philosophy thought that um we communicate in order to exchange information yeah. um, and what we're really doing is i speak um in kind of english you understand the english translated into um, your brain mm. and pass it back and what I'm doing is I'm kind of trying to get yeah. this information we use a common language to get this information from one and you might then think why do we want that because information is power or gets you yeah. sex or money or whatever um, now if you think that's the point of all communication then when you say building your um, latest iPhones or your apps or your Skype programs or you're trying to invent the new snapchat or whatever what what you do is um, email and so on, you, you're building technology that helps you to achieve this single aim or goal mm. to exchange information. And you might do this very fast and so on. But maybe that's not the only reason why we communicate. Maybe when I send you a birthday card, it, it's, it's um, not necessarily to give you any information, but to it's a kind of gift. Um, just like if I were to give you this book, which I won't because it's my only <laughs> copy. I'm, I'm, um, I mean, maybe this is yeah. a bad example because it contains some information, yeah. one hopes. But if I were to give you my son's But if you were to give me the book, you would... The, the, it's you not know, a giving of information. Read it, it would be very low anyway. Um, I might it, as well give yeah, you... Yeah, it'd be an emotional... Um, exactly. Thing. So it's a kind yeah. of... It's, it's, it's a different kind of... Um, and so it's not um, clear that all, all forms... Can be, sometimes you call a friend not to exchange any information but just because they're your friend they're your yeah. mate that's what you do mm. um you meet yeah. up not to exchange information so this is a sense in which if you're under the grip of a particular theory of action it might limit the sort of apps and devices yeah. um, you build because you think this is what we want and and it might exclude all sorts of interesting things we could um we could be doing instead so that's one example yeah. i don't know um, i would just think it's yeah. a second actually before you get the second example think about that makes me think that that complexity of motivation that you talked about previously in our other conversation is actually often what you see is the devices built for quite some that can lock in information exchange people subvert them yeah what's happened is the reason that i can't predict the next snapchat and become a billionaire or whatever um is that People are kind of complicated, and actually, what they want to use them for isn't what they were designed for often. And actually, the tech, one thing the internet's sort of shown us is how people won't use things for what they're meant to be used for, and come up with, you know, for the, for the joys of it. Can't they? Yes, that's exactly that right. So we're, we're we're when we're not doing theory and we're just being in the world, mm. um, all this stuff comes out. It yeah. will it will come yeah. out, and then you see all the different uses yeah. we we have that aren't anticipated when you've got and of course this is a good thing and you can make progress yeah. in these ways um but if we could from the outset start think about uh, think about these things then you know maybe you could make your millions yeah, still so i can make you millions 
um, uh, the second reason won't make you any money, but but it's 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 a more ethical reason. So you have these huge um, debates um, in ethics between, um, especially consequentialists on the one hand and deontologists on the other, maybe virtue ethicists as well. And these debates are about what makes an action right. Is it the consequences? Is it the intention? Um, the purpose? The reason with which you acted? And these theories are really divided. Um, they're really opposed on, but we have different accounts of what makes an action right. They can't both be right. But if you distinguish um, the thing done from the doing, then one question that arises is, um, what makes it right? Um, what makes this thing right that you or I could do together or alone? And what makes my doing it um, right? So, for example, we might both give the same amount of money or the same percentage mm -hmm. of our salaries to charity, and we're both and uh, maybe we pick the right charity and we're both doing the right thing. Um, but you're doing it in order um, to help people in need and I'm doing it to show off in front of a colleague. Mm -hmm. So my doing it is vicious in a way in which you're doing it is virtuous. But we both do the right thing, yet I'm not acting rightly. And so once we start making these, these distinctions, um, you then start to wonder maybe virtue ethics is better suited yeah, sure. for an thinking, account yeah. of um, acting rightly or wrongly and consequentialism better suited for an account of doing the right thing. Because the, the, the problem that many students have, many um, school uh, children have when looking at consequentialism versus deontology is they see through it in, in that it's really simplistic. Right. And they, they know why utilitarianism is such a nightmare and why it's such a horrific way of thinking and reduces ethics to this mechanical system. And yet they also know that a kind of an ethics that pays no attention to consequences and thinks they're irrelevant morally is kind of just mad. That as seems well. wrong too, right? And they, they look at both and they say, well, obviously these are both insane and yet I still want to choose. It's that kind of ridiculous right. choice. So I think um, there is a real need to bring to the surface the question that actually human behaviour, which of course includes, going to include ethics fundamentally, is going to be much murkier than that and require much kind of fine-grained sort of disaggregation. I think that's right. And someone who's not normally thought of as a fine-grained um, philosopher, especially by people who don't read him much, I, I think is, is Hegel. And I think Hegel gets this yeah. um, pretty right. He says um, that... Um, the leaves of um, willing, of pure willing, mm. are dry leaves that never were green. So it's sort of, if you base <laughs> yeah. all your ethics on just the will, you can excuse everything, right? Yeah. Um, all acts are done with a good intention. Yet, on the other hand, he also says, you know, we, we've got to accept the consequences of action that come mm. from, our, from yeah. our willing, even if we didn't intend them in the way Quite they pan sense. out, yeah. right? Um, a stone once thrown is the devil's. Um, yeah. is what yeah. he says so um and once we introduce these different conceptions of action i mean hegel has his own distinctions between different senses of action um we get senses in which it's not just were you or were you not responsible for this action mm. but it may be that you were responsible for it qua known but not qua intended or maybe mm. you should have known but you yeah. didn't and there's different ways in which um what we really want to know was you know who did it? Were they responsible? Yes or no? Yeah. But the answer is far more well, Especially given the conversation we had previously about beliefs and reasons. So, yeah, if I, I did it because, as soon as you've got that because in there, it's implying some previous it's state a, and there's some causal it's connection. It's a dangerous word. And right? so I did it because I believed they were the murderer. So I threw the rock after them when they tried, tried to run away. And you know they weren't, but I killed them. And then you get to a whole moral thing about was he responsible? Was the person who gave him the misinformation responsible? And, That's right. You know, the, the relationship between beliefs and reasons becomes very pertinent, not just the kind of background chatter, the ultimate moral yes. And this is crystallised, I think this is maybe bringing my, my Greek upbringing in, mm. in, in Oedipus. And forget mm. the kind of Freudian stuff on Oedipus. What's crystallised um, in the Oedipus example is that um, he's acting intentionally and mm. he's doing all these things intentionally and and he's the one doing them mm -hmm. um and yet he doesn't intend to kill his father he doesn't intend um to and and so he's kind of on the one hand uh, knows that he's got to take responsibility 
um, for these acts mm. because he is the one who did them. Mm. Nobody makes him um, do them. For all talk yeah. of fatalism in Greek philosophy, it's nothing like the causal determinism of, yeah. of neuroscience. Um, and so he, he, the, these actions are imputed upon him as mm. his own, and yet there's mm. something is missing, which is the desire, intention to do these things. Um, so I, I, I don't think it really kind of brings service to the kind of the complexity of them, and I think hopefully um, gives people a sense that they're actually worth studying at some point. It can matter. Thank you.